I was in a plane uh, last night traveling here from Delhi and I ordered a chicken sandwich for 150 rupees. Uh, two pieces of bread, some chicken in it. Couldn't really get my bellies full last night. Came out pretty hungry when I met Matt. You know. It made me go back to my thoughts, what was in my mind a few months ago, as to then how does 75% of this country live on less than 100 rupees a day? You know, when a single sandwich couldn't really help me much. That was the question that we faced. Um, and I think the reality is that we as middle class Indians have come so far from that threshold of 100 rupees a day that I think we've forgotten on how dire those circumstances are and how many people live on that. Let's just try to understand that number, that 100 rupees a day. How many of you would say, just by a show of hands, live on more than, uh, or, or salaries have, uh, have salaries of more than 25,000 rupees a month? More than 25,000 a month. Don't be shy, it's okay. No one's looking except me. Okay, salaries of, or expense or incomes of more than 10,000 a month. Oh, and if you're students, if you expect to earn more than any of these figures, you can raise your hands also. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. That covers pretty much everybody in the room as I see it. Um, we're talking half of that last value as well. That's 5,000 a month. And guys, the number that we're talking is 100 rupees a day, significantly below that. That number is really, really low, and the sad reality is that most of our country actually lives on less than that. It's really the average Indian income minus the rent expenses. If you would deduct about 50 rupees for uh, rent expenses, the average in income is about 150 rupees a day. So 100 rupees a day is really what's left to live on. And that's the question that you know, we, Matt, and I was trying to, uh, Matt and I were trying to answer as well as to what does it mean to be an average Indian, and that's why we did this experiment, to try and figure out what that Aam Aadmi really means what is he all about, or the, the one that we both worked for nearly two years in the Unique ID project. Right. So taking you know, 100 rupees a day is what Sarah just described, and then four days before we started our experiment, the planning commission says 32 rupees a day. If you, make, if you spend more than 32 rupees a day, you're, all of a sudden you're not poor anymore. So we thought, you know, can we do 32? So the experiment started, so the idea was to do 100 for three weeks and 32 for a week. So, just to give you a glimpse into what it meant to be an average Indian and then a poor Indian, we have a little video for you. Uh, can we just put the video on display, please, and show it? Um, also, if there's a sound connected to the computer, that'd be fantastic. Uh, this is actually something done by NDTV uh, on us. Can we go to the 27th second? No! Yeah, if you can just move to the 27th thicker, would be great. 27, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. It will give you a little glimpse into what our lives were like during that, uh, during that last one week when we lived on 32 rupees a day. This to know firsthand if it's possible to live on 32 rupees a day, the cutoff set by the planning commission for the poverty line. Tushar Vashisht and Matthew Cherian, both graduates from top American universities, wanted to learn more about India. So, four weeks ago, but after the planning commission 32 rupees poverty line definition kicked up a storm, these two former Wall Street employees decided to further scale down their income and chose the house of a farmer in Karagachal, a small town in Kerala, to live it out. True. Uh, so now we can get into some of the findings, uh, key observations that we made during the experiment. So the, the most important thing, I guess the most key thing that was always on our mind during the experiment was the food, right? Because um, at 32 rupees a day, we were spending about 70% of the 32 on food, and at 100 rupees a day, we were spending about 50% on food. So let's look at the food budget. So the one on the left is uh, at 32, and the one on the right is at 100 rupees a day. Um, and you can, you can probably see some key differences right away, which is that at 32, you don't see any you know, dairy for that matter. Uh, very minimal, and you don't see any non-vegetarian items. And at, at 100, you could see some egg products, but at 32, you don't see any eggs. Um, and if you, even if you look at the overall, uh, you know, uh, amounts allocated to each item, it's much, much less at uh, at 32 when compared to 100. And if we if we move to the total caloric distribution, and you see that at 32. You're spending about 1,000. You're, you're in taking about 1,400, uh, and at uh, at 100, you're t in taking close to 2,000 calories. And if you look at FAO recommendations uh, and WHO recommendations for India, uh, for someone who is not active, you know, not doing hard labor, it's about 1,700 calories 
uh, that's recommended um, as an intake. So clearly at 32, you're not getting uh, that amount, you know, the, the, the bare minimum for you to survive. That's one point. The other point is if you look at the protein distribution, the protein at 32 rupees a day is only about, you know, 9% of your calories come from protein. And at, and at 100, it's about 16%, uh, I believe. And these numbers are, you know, even, even the 16 is slightly below the average of what Indian authorities say you should consume. And that's, you know, if you're an average middle class guy, you know, doing your office job, right? And if you go out and if you look at your day laborer who does, you know, hours and hours of hard labor, he needs much more in terms of protein to, like, rebuild uh, his muscles and bones. So it's, it's, it's not a surprise that, sorry about that, that most of our uh, farmers and laborers look like this, right? Because they're in the fields, in the work areas, you know, working really, really hard, but they're not getting the proteins to, you know, rebuild themselves. So that's why they look bone thin, unlike, unlike laborers that you see in, say, most Western countries. And if you, another aspect that we faced was, you know, transportation. And this is really key for us because as, as middle class workers, you know, working in uh, offices, various other jobs, you know, we're used to traveling around, right? I mean, we go to work, we go to see our friends, we go on vacation. But what we noticed is, you know, getting around is really, really expensive. If you were to take the bus, it costs about, you know, uh, 1.5 rupees a kilometer. If you were to take a 25-year-old motorcycle, as we did most throughout our experiment, uh, at least during 100 rupees a day, not during 32, it's about 1.25 a kilometer. And, you know, of course, if you take a bicycle, it doesn't cost you anything on a daily basis. So what, is, what does this mean, right? This means that at 100, and e I mean 32 for sure, and at 100 to a certain degree, you're, you're limited to this five kilometer circle around you, right? I mean, you live here, you work here, your children go to school here. So you don't have a lot of flexibility in terms of, you know, going out and accessing healthcare services or accessing uh, better educational opportunities that can, you know, help you get ahead in life. You're limited to this five kilometer circle and this is where you spend most of your life. And um, so this I already talked about. And this picture that you see here is not surprising, right? Because it's the cheapest way for a middle class family or, uh, I mean, especially a poor class family to get around because, you know, it's only 1.25 per kilometer on that motorcycle. So if you can put five people on it, you know, clearly it's much, much ec more economical to do it this way. And this, I mean, this, this highlights another point, which is that, you know, as, as a country, we don't have any kind of support systems for families when it comes to getting around on the public transport, right? We have, we have many, many different, you know, PATH systems, you know, monthly passes, et cetera, for individuals, but we don't have anything for families. And for, for, uh, for uh, someone living at 32 rupees a day, if you're telling him to go out and get, you know, five, five family passes a month, I mean, that's clearly not affordable. And so, so the, the basic summary from all this is that you cannot get around at 32. At 100, you could do some of these things. At 32, you can't. And 32, you know, the only choice we had was to walk. So this picture is from when we were living in Kerala, and you know, Tushar wanted to go out and see the backwaters. And uh, unfortunately, we were on 32 rupees a day at the time, and so we ended up walking 40 kilometers each way to go there and uh, see the backwaters and come back. Matt talked about a few things that we tracked on our own lifestyle. Um, see, we obviously calculated everything that we did on a daily basis. The thing is, things that trouble us as individuals, as a society, we put a lot of, uh, uh, you know, we put a lot of thought around it. We, we hold our political, elect, politically elected representatives to, ac uh, to account. We hold, uh, you know, government officials to account. But stuff that doesn't bother us directly are the, usually the stuff that gets sort of sidelined. So besides tracking our own lifestyle, Matt and I also try to focus on lifestyles of others around us. And one of the key learnings we found from through this was the thing that you see out here. Addiction is devastating to anything, alcohol, tobacco, everything. Clearly, we were not suffering from it. I'm sure most of you don't also. But the reality is that people who face lives of tall constraints and tough choices usually fall to these addictive substances to rely on. This was a classic uh, view um, at a liquor store around the corner. And, uh, you know, we did a little analysis around their lives by interviewing people at the liquor store and by interviewing Gutka and Panwalas, uh, you know, uh, and who told us that majority of the people do intake these substances on a significant basis. 
And of course, when you put a banker and a policy analyst together, what you get is amazing sensitivity analysis on an Excel. What you will realize though is that if a person typically consumes about 24 BDs or two packs of BDs and say 10 to 15 packs of good cars, which was fairly common as, as per our interviews, his net take home income is only 60 rupees at that point. 40 rupees is gone, it's taken away from money that would have gone to feed the children or cover for their healthcare or education expenses. And if you add in a bottle of liquor on it, unfortunately what you've left is only 15 rupees. What if you're severely addictive on the bottom left area over there, your net remaining income is close, is negative. That means you're stealing from your family's income to feed to your addictive problems. And it's not that they are, these people are to blame. The problem is they're addicted. And that is a really serious issue. The next thing that we analyzed and we sort of thought around us was uh, the fact that mobile has become all pervasive. You know, everybody in the country has a mobile phone today. 900 million people have it. But what they don't have is internet. So um, that's another huge communications need right now and that, uh, you know, we figured that people do deserve to have because we all of us take it for granted, right? You Google things, you Facebook things. Even our videos are going to be on TEDx and YouTube, which you're all going to share and people are going to find out. Many of them are tweeting about it right now, but these guys don't have that opportunity. They don't have the availability of TEDx videos translated to them in their local languages, so they can get inspired by talks such as these and by that of Bunker Roy or by that of, uh, you know, the amazing musician we heard this morning. And we realized that on 100 rupees we could afford internet by substituting, say, cable TV, but on 32 we can't. And one of the biggest plea that we made to the government later was that, hey, try and give internet subsidy on mobile phones. Just by 100 rupees a month, you can actually get all, almost all of India activated on data plans. And that, we believe, is an important finding of the peoples around us as well, that they don't have the access to the same amount of educational health resources like we did. Um, they only have SMS and they have missed calls, and that's what they live their lives on. It's not very sustainable. Mind you, that's only 900 million people. The remaining 300 million don't even have that. So we need to figure out some way of getting these guys connected because mobile is becoming very important for the social fabric of this country. So we talked about you know, some of these really sad things, right? And things that uh, the people at 32 or 100 lack. But there are a lot of bright sides. So what we noticed, for instance, is these people, since they lack many of these material things, they rely heavily on their community to, for, on a daily basis and for you know, key events in their life. For instance, uh, the, the family we lived with in Kerala was telling us that there was this instance when the, the housemaker had to, uh, you know, it was, the, it was the daughter's wedding and there was some sort of a cash crunch and they had to come up with 80,000 rupees in about, you know, two days time frame. And he, he, he was really hard pressed and he thought he was not going to be able to come up with the money and the wedding was not going to happen. Interestingly, without even him going out and asking, the four of his neighbors came together with the money and the wedding did happen. And, uh, you know, maybe his wife told about, uh, you know, told the neighbors. But the, the point is, the community came together to make something happen that was really important to this individual. Um, another thing was, you know, this, this uh, day laborer that we met who spent, you know, the, his second largest expense after uh, food was, uh, you know, martial arts lessons for his son because he felt that since the son didn't attend a great school, by becoming a martial arts instructor, his, he would have a much brighter future than he otherwise would. Um, you know, I think the, the biggest learning we had there was that it's a difficult life, but what's amazing is these people have a lot of aspirations, perhaps even greater than ours. Difficult times turn to even greater ambitions, and was very, very inspiring to learn from that. What have we done since? I mean, uh, you know, we, we realized that information is power, and the fact that we were able to capture their lifestyles and present certain findings and analyze them, uh, it was only... Uh, it, it was only right and adequate that we present them to people who actually can influence policies as well as audiences at large. So we've spoken, we've given lectures at various places including this but amongst various top educational institutes in the country and other academic uh, centers. But besides that we've also gone back to the government and provide two, three very key uh, insights. One is that adequate nutrition is very important and the fact is that people are highly reliant on just carbohydrates at, as Matt alluded to. And the government isn't helping, right? Government is, in fact, doling out more carbohydrates to the public distribution system, that is rice, wheat, and sugar. So one of the key insights we had was, please provide more protein, you know, perhaps in, consider putting more soy in the food that only costs about two rupees per person per day, and in fact can go a very long way into making their overall nutritional balance much more adequate. And we presented that to Montek Singh Alu in the planning commission. 
Uh, the second one was mobile inclusion should be a big goal. I already talked about that. 100 rupees a month can change the game when it comes to how much information and education people can get through that. And perhaps the other one was, you know, kerosene isn't doing much good and people around us were using it to mostly light their houses, which was very inefficient and not to cook foods. Um, and we perhaps said that, you know, we can phase out kerosene and instead replace them with other more meaningful, contextually relevant um, services of today. We also told them that 32 indeed is not enough. Uh, we really need to raise the poverty line because at 32 you're starving, you're very, you have very little inadequate nutrition and if the government sustains 32, chances are that our, uh, our population resource will turn into a liability. So uh, since, since in ending the experiment in uh, late October, uh, we have started a company. Uh, what we realized during the experiment is that while, while at the bottom of the pyramid you see this problem of malnutrition and lack of, uh, you, know, a, you know, lack of resources to do anything with your life, at the top of the pyramid you sort of have the opposite, right? Which is that, you know, people are consuming too much. People are eating too much. People are not walking enough. People are taking their cars to work, coming back, sitting in front of their TVs and, you know, sort of like enjoying life too much, right? And there's this a uh, problem that's prevalent in India when it comes to obesity and lifestyle diseases. And we have, we have started a company to see if we can combat this because the people who are affected by this are the most productive you know, people in our society, the, most, the people who contribute uh, most to in terms of you know, uh, the, the, some of the scientific challenges that we you know, talked about this morning um, and you know, education and things like that, right? So can we, can we build an online and uh, mobile-based platform to help these people uh, live healthier and fitter lifestyles? And that's what we're doing these days. I think we'll just wrap up now. Our time is up. But I think what we'd like to tell you about uh, is just one key insight that we walked away from this experiment, right? Is that we, as educated middle-class Indians, have a tremendous amount of, uh, of competence, of skills, that we can use to do a lot of good. On the other hand, there is the other half of the country which has a tremendous amount of potential just waiting to be unlocked. We believe that it is our duty to use those skills to go and help unlock some of that potential. We can do that as technologists, as educationists, as professors, or as, uh, as, you know, as just aware citizens ready to write about the problems of the other half. But what can result is great outcomes. You know, a little experiment that we did, we believe has caused a lot of policy change. And using our technology and policy insights, we're now talking about creating good tools for, for India to be healthier and fitter. We believe you can do that as well. And we believe that can go a long way to help people who live, who live their lives on less than the cost of a chicken sandwich. Please think about it. Thanks a lot.